Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Paul Richards, um, and welcome to the Minister of Agricultural Digital Series, series number one, the Labor Saving Innovation Speaker Series. Um, we're really pleased to be here, and I have a, a, a strong panel to discuss the topic, discuss the issue. I'll introduce them at a later time. Um, very quickly, some, some housekeeping, very quickly, some housekeeping notes. Um, all participants will have their audio and video turned off during the webinar. If you'd like to ask questions, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen. And if you prefer, you may also ask questions in the chat function. Um, we'll have the four panelists present uh, in sequence and then open it up for uh, discussions and, and hopefully encourage some cross-panel discussion taking place. Uh, the the Q&A will be monitored throughout the session um, and uh, at the, uh, taking place at the end. It'll be uh, moderated through me. Um, really pleased and, and excited about our sponsorships, FCC and Nova Scotia Farm Loan Board. Thank you for your participation and support. Uh, we have a short video from our FCC partner that I would like to share with you. Who is FCC? Well, our About Us is really about you, the goals you want to reach, and the dreams you have. You're invested in your business, and as the only lender 100% invested in Canadian agriculture and food, so are we. Because a dream is just the start. It also needs a lender who understands where your dreams come from, where they can go, and what it takes to get there. If you want to start, grow, or transform your agriculture or food business, we can help. Because we're not just your lender. We're your champion, your catalyst, and we're behind you every step of the way. We are FCC. Dream. Grow. Thrive. Excellent. Thank you, FCC, for your sponsorship. Who, who is it? As, uh, as I mentioned, uh, my name is Paul Richards. Uh, I'm with the Nova Corp, uh, Nova Scotia's venture capital uh, crown corporation. Uh, my particular area is I'm a, a, the ag tech and bioresource sector lead. Um, so uh, I, I work um, very closely with innovators and entrepreneurs looking to solve problems in the ag tech sector. Um, as, as we know, the sector is, is thriving with innovation. Obviously, uh, uh, the, 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 the sector is solving big problems today um, with increasing demand to produce, with more, more production, with less resources, less input, and labor being one of the big challenges. So this discussion and these four panelists will be speaking to their uh, uh, their perspective on the labor issue. Very quickly to introduce the panel um, in, uh, in, 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 in an order of sequence, um, we're gonna have Kim um, Stockdyke present, uh, Dustin Swinkles, Alistair Trowers, and Jeff Mullen um, will each have approximately 10 minutes, 10 to 15 minutes to present, and then we'll enter the Q&A session. This is one of uh, several sessions, future sessions coming up, um, excellence in agri in, for agriculture, climate change adaptation leaders, consumer trends, and entrepreneurial form. All uh, uh, this new format, but um, uh, hopefully some, some riveting and interesting discussions. So, I first want to introduce um, Kim, Kim Stockdale. Bring up my... Introduce Kim Stockdale um, to you. Kim is the chair of the Farm Technical Trade Advisory Committee, who along with other industry experts have worked to provide industrial direction, technical guidance and development for the newly designated trade and training program through the Nova Scotia Apprenticeship Agency. Kimberly will be presenting 
the work through the Trade Advisory Committee and the Nova Scotia Apprenticeship Agency Working Group, the current status in the new training program and opportunities for farmers. Kimberly has extensive experience working with seasonal agricultural workers in the temporary foreign worker program, AgStream. She's also a part, uh, is the past chair of the Nova Scotia Federation Labor Committee and is familiar with the issues facing the farm labor. Kimberly owns and operates uh, Stockdike Greenhouse with her husband, Tim. Their third generation five acre hydroponic greenhouse operation is a key supplier to tomatoes, cucumbers, peppers in the Atlantic Canadian region. Kim, the floor is yours. Well, good morning. Thank you everyone for participating. Looks like we have about 68 people on the call already. So we're very excited about that. Uh, I did get a chance to take a look at the attendee list and that helped us a little this morning. Uh, Faith Matchett, I'm glad to see you're there. I'm sure Farm Loan Board has some folks on as well. Thanks for joining us and supporting the opportunity. And I also see some producers and uh, lots of government and industry support people. And I'm sure that there's processors on here with us as well. So thank you for participating. I'll try to... Um, give you some information of what, what's going on with the Farm Technician Apprenticeship Program. Um, and I do have some slides. I'm a former teacher, so I like to present things visually so that you get a sense of what's going on um, in kind of a more global way. So I'm going to share uh, my screen here with you. I'm going to try. Here we go. Cannot share screen while another participant is sharing. Paul, can you stop sharing your screen and then I will? Yep, I just did. Excellent. All right, here we go. So one more click and we're in. So Farm Technician Apprenticeship Program is a partnership between uh, industry and the apprenticeship agency. And um, why are we doing this? What, what is even the need for this? Why apprenticeship? Well, in Nova Scotia, we have mostly small and medium sized businesses, um, farms, when you consider our size compared to the rest of the country. We have farm owners uh, who are also farm managers. And as we've grown our industry, these farms are getting bigger. We've got uh, farm laborers. And as our farms continue to grow, we bring in new technology and new opportunities and new marketing, our farms grow again. And uh, the pressure on farm owners and managers continues to increase and increase and get more stressful. Well, how are we gonna manage that in terms of labor? Uh, on some farms, we've seen some farm specialists and middle managers come into the picture. And on some farms, they grow that section of their labor with specialists who may or may not supervise other people. Maybe they just have a specialized area uh, that supports what's going on on the farm. And you can see just by color, boy, if a farmer is running a lot of laborers by himself, he's got a lot of stress and he's got a lot of responsibility. As he starts to share that responsibility, uh, you've got a little less stress, and as that's shared all the more, it's even better. Um, why farm apprenticeship? Well, you've got these specialists and middle managers. Some of them are trained, but many of them are not. On my farm, they're not. Um, and I would really love to have some help to train them well and have uh, folks on my farm that are really going the same direction I am and to really have some success for growth. So what happens if we add a layer of apprenticeship, apprenticeship training? Um, you can see there would be some farm managers who would be journey people. They'd be trained and directed on uh, with a structure of how to train their farm managers. As those farm managers, middle managers get trained, they're able to share their information, their knowledge and their experience with laborers on the farm and the farm can be much more productive and far less stressful. And in a time of COVID, we definitely need to have some, some uh, reduced stress. So we think apprenticeship is really a way to go uh, to build that middle. We have support for farm laborers. We've got some um, opportunities for local Canadian laborers. We've got opportunities for seasonal laborers, temporary foreign workers. Um, but this training for middle management and specialists is, uh, is lacking. And we think this is a great opportunity. So the cool thing that we're doing with apprenticeship though is um, we're borrowing from PEI. We're not reinventing the wheel. They've already got a program that works really well. We've talked with PEI. We're using some of the information that they have as well as information that's been gleaned from industry for over a decade on what's needed in the province and industry consultation. Um, and 
we're also building this program so that it could be a Red Seal program. And you need so many provinces to participate in your apprenticeship program for it to become Red Seal. But this is definitely an opportunity and the structure is already going to exist. So once we've uh, proven along with PEI that this program is successful, we're going to be able to uh, share that with other provinces. And then this will become a, a more of a transferable trade. So what is apprenticeship? We've heard about apprentices in electri uh, electrical and welding and auto mechanics. Um, what does it really look like? We don't have it exactly in agriculture. Well, apprenticeship is a standardized model for training. It's basically a skeleton or an outline for how to prepare a training model. Apprenticeship is also a collaboration between government and industry. Apprenticeship is not telling us what to train our people. We're telling the apprenticeship agency what our people need to know in order to be effective and supportive on the farm. And then it's supported by both industry and government. Government's thrown a great deal of money in already to support this in creating uh, the trade and establishing it. And now we're working on the, the content and the curriculum uh, and they've done a great deal to support it already. Industry participation has been excellent and we'll be looking for more of that as we go. So if you're involved in government or another uh, industry organization, this would be a good place for your role to jump in and encourage people to participate in apprenticeship as it comes down the line. So how does apprenticeship work? Uh, basically, you're going to start with a journey person, an apprentice, an expert in the field, and uh, a newbie, maybe somebody that's already on the farm and an excellent farm hand or a farm helper, and you see something in them and they're ready to go. Or it could be somebody that's not in agriculture yet, but would like to be, and there's some partnership that can be built there. Once you've determined a, a partnership, a journey person and apprenticeship that want to work together, um, we create an agreement with the apprenticeship agency. They do all the administrative work. They've got the structure. We just come in and work with them under the structure that already exists. So within that agreement, we have on the job training that's linked to a logbook, So we know what it is that they need to be working on. We've got in-class or online training. And that looks like two five-week sessions over the course of two years. And we have continuous enrollment. So let's say your farm starts somebody this year and your neighbor's farm wants to start somebody next year. We've rotated the program so that we can continuously intake um, apprentices during that time. Uh, and once they've gone through the two years of, or a certain number of hours, which is basically two years of work and the in-class training, they've completed their logbook, they will take a final assessment and they will become officially a farm technician. They can become the journey person on your farm. They can be training new people. So we're multiplying leadership in the agricultural industry. Uh, but what are these people gonna be able to do? Well, a farm technician manages on farm operations and has a knowledge of crops and livestock, as well as operations, maintenance, some repair of farm equipment, machinery, and facilities. They also have technical skills, production skills, personal development, leadership skills, and regulatory awareness. These are all things that will be in the in-class training, part of the logbook and on the job training. And when they've completed it, completed the assessment, this is what a farm technician will look like. So what does that training look like? Let's see if we can get the next page to go here. No, oh, we froze. There we go. Okay, farm technician apprenticeship program content. We've got technical skills, production skills, personal development and leadership skills, and then regulatory awareness. These are the key things that we've found in talking to industry um, that we want to bring to the top as key skills that are cross-cutting skills across uh, sectors um, that we think would be extremely helpful for middle managers or specialized um, farm employees to be able to know and be able to do. Um, so that's what our apprenticeship program looks like right now. Actually, tomorrow we have our next meeting with subject matter experts. We've got uh, people from industry all around the province that are going to join us here in Truro tomorrow. And we're going to uh, wrestle through all of this content information to make sure we've got the right stuff in this, the structure so that when we send our employees or new apprentices through the program, um, it will be what farms need in order to fill that middle role in labor, that labor gap for, for skilled farm supervisors, workers, specialists. 
Um, so that's where we are on apprenticeship right now. Um, and I'm sure there'll be time for questions uh, at some point here shortly. So I'll leave it at that. Um, but I'm very excited about the Farm Technician Apprenticeship Program. Lots more information coming. You can reach out to me. Uh, you can reach out to Apprenticeship or the Federation of Agriculture, and we can all help you to answer your questions. Excellent. Thank you, Kim. Uh, it seems like the apprenticeship program is a very practical uh, process that uses best practices that have been learned from both various locations and also different sectors um, and, and a good model to advance the skills and pass the skills on through, uh, through, through different uh, um, skilled hands on, on the farm and throughout the industry. So great job and that seems very interesting and we definitely will have Q&A and I'm sure a lot of interest in the program. Our next, next speaker is uh, Dustin, Dustin Swinkles. Dustin operates Afton Farms uh, in Antigonish County. The third generation dairy farm consists of 270 milking dry cows, 130 replacement hefflers, and 80 acres of cropland, uh, which grows uh, alfalfa, grass, uh, forage, and corn silage. The farm is constantly evolving, looking for new ways to grow and gain efficiencies. Dun has recent, Dustin has recently overseen the design and construction of a 78,000 square foot dairy farm utilizing some of the most modern technology worldwide. Before returning to home, uh, Dustin worked as a civil engineer and various projects throughout Western Canada. Dustin holds a Bachelor of Civil, civil Engineering from Dalhousie University. Welcome Dustin. Thanks, Paul. So uh, I'm going to walk everybody through kind of our journey uh, over the past few years. Uh, as Paul mentioned, we, uh, we, we've we just recently moved into uh, into a new dairy facility and it's uh, it's been quite a journey uh, and there's been a lot of uh, labor efficiencies that we've picked up along the way. So so I guess my story um, after my stint as, a, as an engineering consultant, uh, returned home to manage the family farm in 2008. Um, since then, there's been considerable effort to grow and modernize the operation. Um, everybody thinks of dairy farms and farms as, you know, uh, it's, it's hard work, throwing hay bales, all that. But uh, we've, we've come a long way uh, over the years. So, uh, you know, uh, our operations and uh, the way we do things have uh, have been upgraded substantially. So um, since uh, since my involvement uh, back in the farm, we've we've reinvested in uh, quite a bit of equipment and upgraded our processes. And uh, you know, it soon became apparent uh, that we were quickly outgrowing our aging dairy barn uh, that was built in 1990. Um, the dairy industry experienced some, some really significant growth uh, back in 2016, 2017 period that, uh, that kind of put us in a really good position to make a sizable investment and, uh, and position us uh, to move forward into the future. So uh, leading up to this, uh, prior to construction, uh, spent a lot of time uh, traveling, talking to different dairy farmers. Um, you know, it's interesting. You'll, you'll go to multiple dairy farms all over the world. And uh, at each one of those dairy farms, you're going to see a different way to milk cows. Uh, it's, it's really intriguing. And, uh, you know, it's definitely worth your while to, to put the time into, into that exercise. Um, you know, I traveled around Canada, US, Europe, as far as way, as far, as far away as, uh, as New Zealand. And, uh, you know, you, you travel around and there's there's all kinds of different ways, you know, you take New Zealand, it's it's primarily pasture based uh, dairy systems, but uh, and, and not really similar to what we see in Canada, but nonetheless, uh, you'll you'll pick up little bits and pieces out of uh, everybody's operation and uh, hopefully piece that together to make something that's uh, that's going to work for you and is going to be profitable for you. So, so fast forward to 2017, um, ready to start building. Uh, we've got a plan in place. Uh, so we opted to do a green site build, uh, totally independent of our old facility. Um, when we did that, it, uh, it didn't restrict us by existing infrastructure and uh, kind of gave us the ability to move forward and, uh, and do what we needed to do uh, to, to put us in a good position. So. <clears throat> 
So uh, that all being said, uh, we ended up uh, constructing a 400 stall sand bedded uh, naturally ventilated uh, barn. So this uh, currently houses our milking herd, our dry cows, our bread heifers, and all of our milk fed calves. So on to uh, the labor components of this build. I guess the centerpiece of, of this build was a 40 cow uh, rotary parlor. Um, and this is a technology that I, I seen picked up in, uh, in New Zealand. Um, you know, it's, it's really interesting. You, you watch them down there and it's nothing to see a uh, husband wife combination, uh, you know, milk a uh, 400 cow herd, right? Uh, I mean, extremely, extremely uh, labor efficient uh, for, for what they're getting. So um, this machine is uh, a bit unique to, to Canada. This is the first of, uh, or one of the first of this brand to, uh, to enter the Canadian market. Um, but what kind of sets it apart from other rotary milking machines, uh, you know, is, is the, the add-ons, the extras, right? So what we've, what we've incorporated into this machine is a pre and post dip, uh, a system that, uh, that basically handles handles a lot of the labor, a lot of the extra jobs that you'd see on these machines. If you travel to uh, places like the US where they've still got relatively cheap labor, um, you know, typically you'd see three to four people operating uh, a machine like this. Um, but we've managed to, to, uh, to get the system to, to operate with one person. So we're, we're, we're achieving uh, 150 cow per hour volumes uh, with a single operator where other, other uh, systems would, uh, would be using at least three people to, uh, to do the same thing. So, so there's a, a few different, uh, different uh, reasons that we can achieve that, you know, one being the pre the post dip sprayers, uh, you know, we've got a quarter pulsation system here that, uh, that basically manages uh, each, each teat independently, uh, allowing us to do all kinds of uh, different things with, with respect to milk let down and uh, stimulation. So um, coupled with that, um, the machine has uh, loads of onboard sensors. You know, we're collecting volume information, we're collecting quality information. Um, you know, the, the data is just uh, astronomical, right? And, uh, you know, we always say, you know, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. So that's becoming much, much more important uh, in the ag world uh, to pick up those efficiencies and gain those efficiencies. So, um, so that uh, that coupled with with other systems, uh, our rotary parlor. Once once the cows leave that uh, that parlor, they go through a, a drafting gate. So if we have any troubles uh, with anybody in the herd, uh, she automatically gets sorted out, uh, sent over to to another pen where uh, you can check her out after milking, or the herdsman can check her out uh, throughout the day, or whatever needs to be done. Um, so, you know, a, a job where if you're going to fetch a cow out of a, a group of 200, uh, that's, uh, that can be a daunting task sometimes uh, with one person. So, uh, you know, just, just eliminating the need for doing stuff like that has, uh, has, has gained us uh, tremendous labor efficiencies. Um, Moving further, you know, just just other things, simple things like manure management that we've incorporated in here. Uh, the scraper systems, they're all smart scraper systems. Um, you know, the drives can tell if there's a problem, you know, if somebody's in the way and uh, the scraper can't uh, can't continue. I mean, it's uh, the, the machine will shut down. It sends me a message, you know, you'll go sort out whatever the problem is uh, and you're back and running again. So stuff like that has, uh, has really modernized and, and revolutionized how we, how we milk cows. You know, we've, we've basically come from, uh, you know, a staff, a staff here. We've, we've, we've got about six full-time um, employees that operate here. And that really hasn't changed in the last 10 years. We've more than doubled our production uh, over, the, over the last 10 years and, uh, and keep, kept the, the, same, the same amount of staff on board. So uh, stuff like this has, uh, has really been instrumental to, uh, to, to us uh, realizing those labor efficiencies. So, so uh, that being said, to tie it all together, um, 
you know, one of our main focuses when, when we designed and built this facility was, uh, was so that the majority of tasks that we do day to day could be managed by one person. Um, you know, and, and the, the theory that, you know, two people, you can get the job done quicker, but, you know, take, take uh, in the context of our parlor right now, we're achieving milking speeds of 150 cows per hour with one person. Uh, if I can achieve milking speeds of 200 cows per hour with two people, is it really that much more efficient? So uh, it's stuff like that that we've uh, that we've really grasped onto, and uh, the whole one person philosophy has worked out quite well for us in a in a post COVID era. Um, we don't really have a whole pile of interaction between employees. Uh, you know, they they have their job post and they stick to their job, and they don't really uh, there's really no need for intermingling. Um, so uh, that and uh, one final note that I'd like to pick or point out, um, you know, when we talk about labor efficiencies and one thing that we've really uh, latched on to here too is, uh, you know, we, we talk about, we talk about milking labor and whatnot. Um, you know, so if you overcomplicate a system too much, we've found, uh, all you're doing is eliminating a $20 per hour position and replacing that with a $50 per hour technician position. So what we've opted to do is try to keep our systems as simple as possible. Uh, you know, this, the, the whole, the whole idea, uh, the, the KISS methodology, we used to call it uh, back in school, uh, trumps, trumps all. Uh, so, so as, uh, as simple as you can keep things, uh, it's better for employees, it's better for the cows, and it's uh, better for me at the end of the day. So I'll, uh, I'll leave it there. And uh, like I said, I look forward to, uh, to any questions. Excellent, uh, Dustin, thank you very much. Uh, Unquestionably, you're, you've developed a, a, a business, become a business role model for efficiency. It's obvious that uh, you developed a, a consistent, pragmatic approach for uh, uh, for finding efficiencies throughout your process. And I like your 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 thoughts on keeping it simple and making sure you don't replace a twenty dollar employee with a fifty dollar employee employee. So uh, that is that, that's good uh, advice for all of the. Uh, companies here today. Thank you. Uh, our third speaker is uh, Alistair Trowles from Ingenuity. Uh, if people travel in the startup uh, ecosystem and the innovation ecosystem, they very quickly meet uh, meet Alistair and learn about Ingenuity. Um, Alistair is, was originally born in Cheddar, England, home of the famed cheese. Uh, a lot of activities, farming activities, ranching activities throughout the world. But in 2005, uh, Alistair moved to Halifax to dive into the ocean tech sector, um, ocean marine. In 2014, Alistair joined the Ingenuity firm, Ingenuity Group, focused on solving complex pro engineering problems for producers and manufacturers in the Maritimes, designing new products, for entrepreneurs and commercializing their own ideas. Ingenuity has, qu has quickly become a local powerhouse employing graduates, attracting overseas talent and helping businesses remain competitive through automation and robotics. Elf, uh, uh, Elfie volunteers uh, on the executive of Halifax Search and Rescue, loves to cook and loves ingredients, uh, keeps chickens, collects antique maps. Uh, as I said, Alistair has become a fixture in the startup world, so uh, has a lot to, to offer this discussion. Alistair? Thanks, Paul. Uh, pleasure to be here. Pleasure to be on the panel. Um, I've got a slide deck here, which I will just try and share up now. Hopefully everyone can see. Just a brief intro uh, into Ingenuity as a business, who we are, what we do, what we stand for. Um, but I tried to focus it very much on agriculture and the agri-food sector. We're doing a lot in food processing, uh, less so right now in primary processing. But the line is very blurred these days between primary pro production and processing. Most farms I've been to recently have been, have been both, or certainly they're morphing towards both. Um, I have got a couple of videos on this uh, on this presentation, which will um, hopefully 
run. We've practiced, so hopefully they'll run, they'll run okay. Uh, firstly, just appreciate everybody's time. We've got 77 attendees on the call now, and uh, so it's great to have so many here. It's a shame we can't be, uh, we can't be uh, all in the same room together, but um, needs must. So who are we? We are a 36-person uh, business. Um, we started 17 years ago uh, by Ben Garvey, who's still involved in the business. He's the president and uh, CEO. Uh, he's a mechanical engineer by training, grew up in Canning in, uh, in uh, Nova Scotia, um, and very much grew up in a farming scene um, and intuitively uh, instilled in himself and his early employees the ability to solve problems quickly with the uh, things that you have in your pockets as uh, most farmers have to do on a, a regular basis. We have uh, 34 people, 35 people I think as of today uh, across the team and I'll break into that in a bit more detail as we go through the uh, through the presentation. We run through four different focus programs. Um, aerospace and defense we have a sector, we do a lot in what we term industry 4.0 which is very much where this uh, audience would, would fit in right now based upon the the, uh, the various funding programs that are available. Uh, we have a new product development stream. So if people have ideas, they come to us and we can help them realize those ideas into pro pro products. Uh, and um, the, uh, the, the last one is uh, industrial marine, which is uh, traditional engineering where, where we uh, see a lot of our work. Uh, as of right now, um, we have 170 happy clients on our books um, and very, very few unhappy. There are always a couple of unhappy, but for the most part, we, uh, we leave clients very happy with uh, the experience of dealing with ingenuity. Over the last few years, we've uh, completed 300 projects since we started counting uh, in 2014, 2015. Uh, so we're, we're very busy, very active. At any one time, there's 40 or 50 active projects going through the books. So we are a uh, creative engineering firm. It's probably the easiest way of describing us. We focus on process improvement. We focus on new product design and solving complex engineering challenges. And one may ask, how does that materialize itself into farming and agriculture in general? Every single one of these, uh, these three points come across in, in the things that you do every day. So how are we structured? Uh, we have a... Uh, a fairly complex diagram here, and I'll try and I'll try and make sense of it. Uh, I mentioned the four programs earlier. The uh, the four programs each have a program manager, so typically an engagement you would be working with a program manager. We have a very strong mechanical group of eighteen people, um, focusing on design, cranes, machines, systems, um, and uh, solutions to problems. We have a six or seven person automation and robotics team, so that that group is getting into PLC control systems and robotics, conveyor systems, and so forth. We also have our, our, an embedded electronics team of five, six people in the business. Um, and these guys are very busy in uh, things like near field communication, uh, development of sensors. Um, we've done quite a lot of farming control systems. So we're working a lot with indoor farming and increasingly with outdoor farming uh, to try and get more data into the mix. And I'll, I'll spend some more time on that in just a minute. And we have advanced engineering, which is a bit of a catch-all group, uh, but we have on staff an industrial designer. We have a uh, material specialist. We have finite element analysis in-house on staff. We have a machine shop right here. So we can design and build right here in, uh, on Herring Cove Road at our facility in Halifax. And uh, we are, for the most part, probably maximum three hours away from any one of you on the call. Uh, so we're very accessible and uh, very creative in our problem solving. The three areas I put in green here are really the ones where I would see a mix, uh, a, a match for this audience. So I mentioned Industry 4.0 earlier. So this is uh, things like in Internet of Things and communication, uh, in-field sensing, communicating back to farm management systems, productivity and quality assurance, machine health and remote monitoring, uh, so systems that are really looking at uh, how is how are my machines running and can I control them and, and adjust them on the fly. Um, and inexorably, AI and machine learning is coming into the mix. So we're having conversations now about using cameras to monitor crops in fields, uh, camera systems and vision to monitor livestock and livestock health. So there's a lot of machine learning that's coming into the sector as, as time progresses. 
So how do we make sure everything runs smoothly? Uh, we have a design process. We try and make it as lean and fast and creative as, as possible. We are a very creative group and we like to get stuff moving very quickly and work in a methodical manner. It's pretty straightforward. Uh, most ideas come from the floor, come from the farm, come from the factory, and they sit in someone's head. We have a discovery process whereby we, we work with that idea. We wrap a team around the problem or the challenge that we've identified. And we lay that down on paper. So we really try and get under the skin of the problem, uh, understand the, the, the functional blocks that make up the solution to that problem, understand what you've tried before to, to try and solve uh, a, a particular challenge in the workplace, and then lay down the building blocks for success of how that problem will get solved. Typically that will start with conceptual design. So we, we uh, work out how we're gonna prove a concept, and then we very practically get into the shop start cutting metal, cutting wood, 3D printing, using clay, whatever it needs to prove that concept would potentially work. Uh, and then from there, once we've, we've established that yes, we can break the back of the problem, we then move into a, a, a detailed design step whereby we're ordering equipment, we're building customized, custom designing equipment. We then typically will build it in-house in our robotics and automation lab downstairs, test it with your product, and uh, when you're happy with it, you come down here, you sign off on it. Uh, we then document, rip it down, bring it to site and install. This is typically how we would go with, through a, a process automation uh, project. Uh, and it very much is centered around risking capital investment and making sure you're, you're learning by doing it. I do have a couple of examples of uh, where we've done that um, later on. So we'll talk about data for a little bit. What is possible? Data is everywhere. Obviously, everybody carries a phone. Uh, farming systems are getting much more complex. And uh, the, the, the amount of data that's out there is, is growing exponentially. But fundamentally, what can we do? We can understand and control our growing process. We can potentially preempt our next decision, whether it's a grow decision or a business decision, investment decision. We can understand process lag and choke points. So where is my, my process inefficient and how do I improve it? We can use data as an early warning for failure. So when is that particular machine gonna croak on me uh, two weeks before it's required? We can use data for customer feedback and getting knowledge of our, of our market and using that in, in any decision we make at the production, uh, the production end of the process to ensure that uh, we're growing and producing a product that is fit for market and is needed in market. We can also interrogate on the processing side, interrogate rework and fail. So if you have a, a, a value add process that you're automating, uh, we focus very strongly on where areas where you're reworking, where you're rejecting and how, how to uh, radically reduce those to improve overall productivity. I guess the ultimate is data will always answer the next business question. So whatever the business question is you're asking, uh, we will work with you to put in a, a, a metric system that will allow you to solve and answer that question. So we wanna make better decisions. We wanna create efficiency in the workplace. We wanna gain control. And ultimately we wanna maintain competitive edge and competitive advantage in, in anything we do. So where do we start with uh, an engagement with um, anybody uh, in this industry sector? We would always look at process improvement assessment. So this is where we would bring a team in and actually step through a process and understand where the choke points are and give you a bit of a plan on how to improve your process over and above the work you've already been doing uh, and really give you break, break that plan down into cogent steps so you understand where you can go for funding assistance, uh, where you can go for systems, and where you can really make the best bang for the buck in, inside the business. We look at automation and robotics. So we've talked a lot already today about greenhouses and indoor growing, but how is uh, automation gonna be affecting value add processes? How's it gonna be affecting um, uh, processes in field and in barns uh, across the region? The other two on the right-hand side, SCADA, which is Supervisory Control Data Acquisition. This is an industrial uh, term, and it's very much coming into farming. So really putting sensors on everything you have to give you a big picture of what's going on in your system and where the choke points are and how do you improve, and then ultimately getting that 
data to your phone. I mentioned uh, iFarm and AI earlier. So we're doing a lot of work in cannabis and in vertical farming uh, using farm control systems and sensors. Um, those are naturally progressing out into fields and open field uh, agriculture as we speak. So down to the meat and potatoes, if you'll pardon the pun, um, I've put a few logos of companies that we've worked with. Um, these are all agriculture focused in, in one way or another. Um, we are doing a lot of work with um, the, the support network that farmers are already working with. So people like uh, Apex and CMP up in Charlottetown, uh, we are always working with companies that are fabricating. Abco is another good example. So companies that are building conveying systems and machinery automation systems, we are often the design partner that they will turn to. But we're working with large ag in terms of AgriPure, Honeybee, uh, those, those sorts of companies, and then uh, individual farmers. So Mark Sawler is, uh, is picking up the phone to us on a fairly regular basis um, when he's got a particular problem that he's uh, looking to uh, solve. So I wanted to focus on two particular projects that are um, they're seafood related, but still obviously a wild harvest um, seafood. Uh, and really, it's about understanding the kinds of challenges and, and how we're approaching uh, these problems. There's a lot of words here. This this deck is really designed to, as, a, as a giveaway after the event. Uh, so it is available if anybody would like it. Um, but Ocean Pride Fisheries down in Pubnico, they have a, um, a, a real issue of uh, labor, like many companies, uh, getting the right people to do the right job uh, within their process environment. And they came to us with a challenge of we need something to speed up and uh, improve our quality assurance and grading of our dried sea cucumbers, which is a highly valuable product uh, headed mostly for the Asian market. The bottom line is we ended up working through the process with them, uh, taking what the um, the, the workers on the line were doing as a QA step, and then breaking that down into its constituent parts, and designing a machinery system end to end that would allow them to reduce labor, reduce work, reduce effort in terms of physical lifting, but improve throughput and improve output. Uh, so what we ended up here with, and this video tells a, a thousand words, so I will run the video now. What we've ended up with here is, if things work, Go to YouTube. So these are dried sea cucumbers that are harvested off the, uh, the coast of Nova Scotia. They're processed on site, they're dried. And then here we have a vision camera system that is one a second looking at individual uh, sea cucumbers as they go through a process, uh, making sure that they are graded in the right way. So this here we're looking at a, is a singulator. So each sea cucumber is, uh, is put into a single lane, singulated, and then the vision system is able to reject the ones that it thinks are second class or second rate, uh, which get processed into a different type of product. It's quite a simple um, job that the, the, the camera system is doing, but it is vital uh, to this particular operation because they, they simply cannot find the workers to do the job and visual comparison is always very subjective. The, the, the way that they've approached this problem is to, to utilize the technology to improve their consistency and overcome some of their labor issues. The second example here is IMO Foods. These guys are down in Yarmouth, Nova Scotia. Um, it's a, a, a very old building, it's a hundred year old building. It's a, sea, it's a seafood cannery. So they're using, uh, again, locally caught herring. They are um, steaming or smoking the herring and putting it into cans. The cans are produced on site. The, uh, the smoking is done on site. It's one of the, I think it's the only cannery in the world that does the entire process in one building and one site uh, end to end. So the challenge there was how do I get the most out of my building? How do I overcome some of the labor issues that I've, I've got in, in the, uh, the facility? And uh, how do I in, improve my throughput? So again, I'll uh, click to video. We'll get this rolling as soon as we can. And uh, this will hopefully step you through the, the process. So this is the building, it's very old. Um, it's been here for, for quite a while. It's been producing canned seafood for some time. 
we get behind the scenes, we've put in a, a robot system, we've put in a, a spiral conveyor to lift food uh, through the building and reduce the amount of handling and rework that's going on through the process. Uh, this is a, uh, it's quite an investment over the course of about four months. Uh, the, the downtime in production was virtually nothing. The, uh, the line was running all the way through the implementation. Um, and this entire system was set up in our lab ahead of time to work out all of the bugs and uh, make sure that when it went into the factory itself, it was, uh, it was gonna work seamlessly. Last up, this is more um, complex engineering, I would say, um, just to give people a heart attack looking at the, uh, the vision on screen. What we're doing here is we're using mechanical engineering finite element analysis to really understand how how problems occur in production. So this is a shaker table um, for Smith Foods uh, with Charlottetown metal products. And this was a failure. So this was a piece of machinery in the field that was failing. Um, we get this quite a lot with uh, potato harvesters, potato graders, anything that is designed to work outside in a harsh environment. Uh, so we have the ability and the skill set in-house to take a design, put it through its paces using the computer rather than using physical testing and then improve the design to ensure that the, the, the machine is gonna work when you need it to work, which is absolutely critical in all aspects of farming. It's just a good example of uh, where, we, where we put the, the real engineering to work. So what I wanted to do today as part of this discussion, I'm, I'm, we're looking forward to the Q&A because that's, the, uh, that's the, the, the real value of these sessions, is to get under the skin of some of the problems that are happening out there and really understand where local resource can be applied to help local farmers, local food producers improve and stay, uh, stay market ready. Uh, so to that end, I'd also, as part of this discussion, like to offer an hour on site um, for anybody on the call who wishes to, uh, to, to move forward and improve their processes. Let's go to the, uh, the link that I've put there and uh, feel free to get into this. Over to you, Paul. Excellent. Thank you, Alistair. Uh, innovation doesn't happen in a vacuum. Uh, as, as we look to build uh, an innovative ecosystem in Atlanta, Canada, organizations and individuals like Ingenuity are, are, are critical to, uh, to help uh, innovation take place. And obviously, if that presentation is obvious that uh, the experience is there. Uh, if we talk about assets and facilitators of innovation, ACOA has been doing it for a long time. And our next speaker, Jeff Mullen, has been a, 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 at the center of a lot of what ACOA has been doing. Um, Jeff has worked with ACOA, uh, Atlantic Canada Business Agency, uh, Opportunity Agency for over 30 years. Uh, he began his career as a chartered accountant and joined ACOA in 1993. Jeff has worked with businesses from a range of sectors, including manufacturers, ocean technology, ICT, resource industries, helping them to establish, expand, and improve productivity and their profits. Jeff has been the director of enterprise for ACOA since 2005. Along with his team, he manages an annual program budget of $50 million. Jeff, floor is yours. Thanks so much, Paul. <clears throat> so far, this has been a very uh, informative panel. I, I've learned a lot from cows to greenhouses and uh, what Ingenuity is doing. Um, I must say that uh, for the last five or six years, we've we've taken a little bit of a different approach at ACOA. I mean, we finance projects for sure. Uh, when it comes to seafood and agriculture, we are very much focused on the value added or processing end as opposed to fish harvesting or primary agriculture. But when you look at the opportunity that is there um, and how vitally important our agriculture sector is and our seafood sector, of course, uh, we know that there are some very fundamental challenges. Uh, and usually when you go around and you like, we started the process of going around and saying, do you want to expand, shifted it to what's keeping you awake at night? I mean, what really is bothering you in terms of being able to operate your, your business or to be competitive in an increasingly worldwide uh, 
village. Um, and it invariably always comes down to things that we've already just been talking about. Uh, access to highly skilled labor or just access to labor. Number two, um, being the, the world pressures around being competitive usually means new concepts are becoming ever present like traceability and the need to use blockchain quality uh getting into uh the marketplace increasingly complex because you have to basically almost be audited over a period of time to sell to big uh, wholesale or retail operations so it it all points to the need for uh to embrace new technology or to uh to actually become a, an innovative company uh right from the top to the bottom everybody needs to start thinking about innovation and it's a very scary thing to even think about that and and i have to tell you that uh, some of the largest companies in nova scotia are reaching out to us to say we don't know how to innovate we know we need to deal with all of these issues that i had just mentioned but we don't know how to innovate so we've we've really uh, focused uh, the alphabet soup of all the government programs that are out there. And I'll just list a few of them off. Like we've heard from FCC, there's the Farm Loan Board, there's Nova Scotia Agriculture and Fisheries, there's uh, NRC IRAP, BDC, NSBI, InnovaCorp. I mean, there's, there's a lot of players, but I think what we would prefer to do is look at the company and say, how do we help them through the process of innovation? How can we support uh, the process? Now, Elf, you laid out a good process map as to how you would do that, but not all companies are aware of that of that system and how to. So we're willing to invest to bring in firms like an Ingenuity or others to help to go through that process and and use basically play it back to the owners who go to the building every day and they don't see the problems that uh, an independent cold set of eyes can see uh, so start the process by looking at what you're doing uh, you've probably been doing the same thing for 20 years uh, and you don't know what the rest of the world has done to leap uh, beyond you so a process uh, of looking at what your operation looks like, identifying the bottlenecks and the weak points, and then start uh, developing strategies or even projects to start uh, dealing with those issues. And it could be automation. It could be bringing in uh, data. Uh, once, you know, it's one thing to bring machinery and, and equipment in and robots and automation, but the, the real opportunity is to start to monitor to get the data off of those systems so that you it becomes part of your management and getting more efficiency higher productivity more traceability because the world wants that and uh and hopefully uh increase your bottom line and i think that at the end because i am a bean counter you you only make project decisions if you feel that you can get a return on your investment so one thing that Elf, you did not probably put in there so much is part of what you do is you actually calculate, here's what your payback will be uh, through the investment in automation. So ACOA is very interested in investing in all that stuff. Secondly, uh, and uh, Paul, you had mentioned this, we've been investing in tech technology startups in a very aggressive way for the last 15 years. And uh, a lot of the startup, communities are looking at the need for innovation and technology adoption in the agriculture primary agriculture processing and seafood harvesting and seafood processing these are sectors that are in dire need of implementation of new technologies from the use of drones to the use of automation in uh, in seeding farms of uh, think about fishermen having uh, technology to have ropeless gear to avoid whale uh, entanglements. There's a there's an unbelievable wide range of technologies that are needed. And I can tell you that it may not be uh, 
may not be known to most primary operators that we have a very, very rich and deep startup community that uh, could be, and, and so Paul and I, our job is to create collisions between these processors and these little technology companies that have technologies that will like, greatly improve the efficiency and the safety of food production uh, in our province. So I think, uh, and we're investing in those startups and, and part of investing in those startups is getting them that reference client. So we would like nothing more than to, uh, as you go through a process of saying, I think I have a problem here and we validate that through, you know, bringing engineers in, but then we, our job and uh, Paul and I and Perennia would be to search for where the solution to that problem is. And it might very possibly be a local technology company that could uh, bolt their technology into your process and improve your production and improve your food safety uh, and uh, have hopefully even reduce your labor challenges. So I will stop. Basically, ACOA is a, a funder, but our zeroed in focus is on innovation and technology development and technology deployment. So um, I think I will stop there, Paul, and, and I look forward to any questions people would have. Excellent, thank you, panelist. Uh, now is the Q&A time. I'm gonna start, but I invite uh, everyone to, to chime in and ask questions. Uh, some we may not get directly to in the remaining time, but we'll do our best to, to answer. Um, all of you have been working in, 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 in the sector and helping with the integration of innovation, automation in farms. Um, you probably have an assessment or, or a good indication indication of what is the readiness? What, what, what readiness needs to be there? What signs or characteristics do, uh, do the firms need to have to be, we'll call it ready or prepared for making this investment or determining if this uh, investment is, is appropriate? Um, Alice, we're gonna start with you because you guys work with 170. Um, you, there must be signs that you look at to say oh, this company is prepared or these are warning signs to say they haven't really looked at the full implications of what this might look like. I think the, um, the we looked at the data um, over the last few years, but in, in the last month or so, we've looked at a, a bunch of data of past projects and the successful projects have been in businesses that were already innovating. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, farming by default, you have to be innovating the whole time. Um, the, the shops are never open when you need them. Uh, the trip to town is um, always at the wrong time. Um, and I'm speaking from my own experience when I was in, in Patagonia. You know, if you're out in the middle of the camp, and the nearest town is 70 miles away. You soon become pretty good at solving your own problems with what's in your pockets or what's you know what's on the tractor or in the truck or whatever um so farmers are already doing that uh, in general and if, if you have the the innovative the innovative streak running through you then you are more likely to uh want to make things better want to make things work uh, want to improve things um and then the other one to say and we see this a lot in seafood as well is where the generation shift has already occurred. So when the, the next generation has come in um, and, you know, Kim and Dustin are on the panel now, you know, they're, they're in that position. So they've come in, they've, um, they've had former careers and they're bringing, uh, they're bringing that experience back onto the farm. And I think those are, those are really the two that, uh, that now I know that I would look for. Uh, Jeff Kim, uh, from from your perspective, is there a a readiness that you look for 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 yeah. this? I I think it's it's been a the first few years was really tough to start saying, you know, reflect on yourself. Are you innovative? Are you keeping up with your competition? And yeah, well, you know, well, I'll get to that. That's basically it. And then the labor issue started to hit, and then it's like, oh, we should have done this five years ago, but now we have to do it. But they're still not really, it's still going in at kicking and screaming, right? And then something happened. It was amazing. Last year, about a year ago now, the pandemic hit. 
I, I was traveling, but I came home and I thought, uh oh, we're shut down. This is, you know, industry is going to just, you know, lock up their wallets and, uh, and, you know, try to survive, but won't be doing any innovation for sure. I was completely wrong. Uh, unbelievable. When the, uh, when the economy started to open up again, and workers could come back if they wanted to come back, they had to work in an environment that required separation, PPE, all that kind of stuff. And it forced the companies then to say, okay, I definitely need to get into investing in my company. Uh, and if I'm going to invest, I might as well adopt innovation, automation. And then the next step is to bring the digitization to that as well because you have to operate now in, a, in, a, in an extreme environment and the demand for food never went away. So uh, and actually the way that the market went is that quite often you weren't selling to wholesalers or distributors anymore because the restaurants were hardly hit by this thing. So every, a lot of people realized that they needed to go innovation right through to direct retail, direct to market sales. Therefore they had to have a website, never had a website before or e-commerce and then customers wanted to know full traceability. So it, it, if you start listening to the market and the market shifted on you like it did with the pandemic, you will then embrace an innovation. And then you, that's where it became very busy for us because we were trying to support these companies as they go through that innovation process. Excellent, excellent. Yeah, I guess I would chime in as well to say I, I agree with Alistair's perspective um, that you know the people that are going to be innovating are the people that are thinking about innovating already. And I'll just give you an example that kind of blends what Alistair and Jeff both had to say. Um, we're constantly looking at ways to be more efficient. We're researching different pieces of equipment and technology that we could use, and then we put it through the filter of you know well what's the payback? How long does it take to pay back? Is it really worth it? Um, and we always settle with a few things that we go, man, this is a cool idea. It's probably going to save us some money or make us some money. And we need to be thinking about it in the next one to three years. Um, and the pandemic hit. And one of the biggest, dirtiest jobs we do is clean up at the end of the season. And we found a way for the last 10 years um, to clean up and contribute to our community. So we Im invite volunteers to come in. They pick a charity that they want to donate their their earned money to, and 50 people come into the greenhouse all in one day, and we just struggle and hand bomb all of the plant material and all of the growing media and everything out and clean up and um, just do the nitty gritty stuff. And it's so much easier to get a group of people together. We are all working for a common goal. We're cleaning up. Well, in the pandemic, you cannot bring 50 people in to a small area and you've got your already, you know, isolating or bubbled up workers and you want to keep them healthy and safe so that you're ready for the next season that starts in two weeks. Um, and so we had a piece of technology that we were looking at and there were two different units. One, we were not going to make any money back on. The other was a smaller unit and we definitely could afford it. There were some good programs available through NSDA and the federal government. And so we bought this unit. Um, that goes through the greenhouse. We put out uh, basically a piece of fabric in every row. You drop the plant material on it and the, the machine pulls all of that old plant material in and it dumps it into a pile and we're easily able to get that out of the greenhouse. Now, what used to take us um, 25 minutes a row with 50 people, we could now do with three people who were already in a work bubble working together. They were no, they're not a risk to each other and we could do it in a minute and a half. So, wow. you know, the savings in time and labor, that machine, if it hasn't already paid for itself, it will by the end of 2021. Um, and now we have that piece of technology on hand. Um, we're sad to miss that connection with the community to have people come into the greenhouse and get to know what we do. And we're, we have to use other means, whether it's social media or a website to make that connection now. Um, but we're keeping our team safe. We are moving quickly. We're doing less physical labor. It's actually uh, less of a, a hazard on the farm, less of a safety risk for our team. Uh, it's less work. We're not dreading the work day. We can spread it out over a couple of days and get it done quickly without a lot of 
physical labor. Uh, and so those are the things we're looking at. And I think, you know, even small examples like that, that's one little piece of machinery that's going to save us some time. Um, there's certainly other things that we're, we're looking at to improve our efficiencies. Um, and, you know, in the past, we've had people come in and look at, well, what's this process that we're doing? How can we do it better? Does it make sense to buy a piece of equipment or do we just change, you know, the, the workflow? Um, it's farms and, and operations that are constantly looking for that are going to stick around in terms of our sector. Um, when we first came uh, to the farm and I stepped into a family farm 10 years ago, that's third generation, we were told, you know, oh, well, 20 years ago, there was a lot more acreage and greenhouses in the province. Well, where did they go? Asking around, those are the people that were not in innovating and we're not keeping up with, you know, the production, cost production and, and production per square foot and so on. In order to do that, you've got to have the technology. So we're not going to quit. We're continuously looking at opportunities to be more efficient with the space that we have. Uh, and with the technology available to us, but it's got to have a good return on investment. Excellent, excellent, very good point. I have a question from the audience here, uh, and I'll open it to all the panelists. Is there, a, is there a system to capture the farm innovation developed on the farm to take it to the larger markets when the farmer's interest is only adopting it for their own farm? Otherwise, the opportunity doesn't reach its full market or help the larger industry. Kind of how do you take the innovation that a farmer has? They're an innovative uh, uh, group. How do they how do they innovate? How do they take that to uh, become a, 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 a its own product? I can jump in there if you like, Paul. Um, we have quite a few innovators that walk through the door here. Uh, entrepreneurs, people that want to want to uh, build their own thing uh, in whatever sector it is. Um, if the farm themselves that develop the technology aren't interested in pushing it forward, then you know I would suggest throwing it into the ecosystem locally. So you have the Ignite Labs down in Yarmouth and uh, Picto, um, which is a home for incubation for ideas. Uh, you have Idea Hub at Dalhousie, um, and then all of the surround sound programs that Jeff mentioned earlier, so NSBI and ACOA, NSCI, RAC, and all of those. Um, it really does need a champion. It needs someone to push it. So that could be a relative. It could be a friend. It could be someone associated with the farm that has that entrepreneurial bent that wants to take it forward. But there is a very, very solid innovation ecosystem and commercialization ecosystem in Halifax and the wider community. Um, so I would, I would encourage, you know, um, go to Jeff, come to me, um, go to Doug Jones at Ignite, go to Margaret Palmer at Idea Hub. Uh, these people are all living and breathing in that space. Excellent. Thank you. Dustin, a uh, question for you. you you're the, uh, the, the role model on the panel of, uh, of taking the, making the investment, taking the chance, uh, implementing the technology. Uh, what was the evaluation that you went through to determine the, the, the size and the type of the investment. Talk a little bit about your process that you went through. Yeah, that's a good question. It's a, it's a real challenge. You know, you're, you're trying to predict where you're going to be in the next uh, 10, 15, 20 years. Uh, you know, what kind of, what kind of an investment, uh, you know, how big do you go? Uh, you know, what, what are you looking at? Um, you know, it's certainly, certainly kept me up a lot of nights, uh, you know, in the lead up to that. And uh, like I mentioned, uh, when I spoke earlier, you know, we, we kind of came through the heels uh, of, of a lot of growth or came through a, through a time uh, with a lot of growth uh, in the, in the dairy industry in, in 2015, 16, 17, you know, everybody was back on butter and everything. Uh, so, you know, we've seen a lot of growth uh, possibly coming and then, you know, we're, we're into this build a, a year or two in and then we get hammered by, uh, you know, a lot of uh, repercussions from trade deals and stuff like that. So, I mean, that being said, you you push forward, right? You uh, you make it work, but uh, things are never going to go the way uh, the way you expect. Um you know the investment we made we could justify it based on uh based on the position we were in at the time 
and uh, it's more or less what we what we needed to do to to stay in business. You know, it comes back to to a point that uh, that Kim made earlier about uh, you know if you if you don't continue to innovate, uh, you're not going to be in the industry very long. You know, I think primary agriculture. Um, you know, the costs continue to, to go up, you know, our input costs uh, go up, I'd say at a, at a higher rate than, uh, than what we sell our product for. Um, so, you know, we're continually looking for, for internal efficiencies, right? Uh, you know, and, and in, the, in the case of dairy, I think, you know, a dairy cow 20 years ago uh, wouldn't last very long in my barn today, you know, even genetics and, uh, and everything has come into play. So, you know, to, to do an investment like this, you, you almost have to decide whether you're going to stay in the industry or if you're going to get out of the industry and, and do something else. So, you know, that's kind of the thought process. Uh, you know, you, you make the long-term commitment to be here and, uh, and decide what you need to do to set you up for the next 20 years. Excellent. Much of the innovation that we're going to implement in the firm is is um is brought in it's 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 technology transfer from other regions often from holland or europe or united states and there's a lot of fear around uh buying technology how is it going to be supported what if it breaks down um, those are practical uh, fears that people have each one of you have uh, a, a hand in various different ways to help de-risk and support that. Um, what advice would you give to a, a firm making that decision at this point of what do they do? I think the, the most important thing is don't buy the shiny piece of technology some salesman's trying to sell you because they're not talking about how they're gonna support you. They just want the sale. And so if, if we're involved at ACOA, we would, we would encourage a slowdown, map it out, tech assessment, what is the problem you're really trying to solve? And then you talk about how do you support that? Because if you're in a must run 24 seven food processing operation and that thing breaks, well, that's a disaster. And just the thought of that happening probably stops the, the, pro, the, the whole thought of innovating. So, Unless you've solved the problem of slow down, make sure you do it right. Make sure that there is a ser service provision. Um, I know that Ingenuity represents a number of automated companies from abroad, but they can service that equipment. And there are other Ingenuities too. Sorry, Alpha, I have to say that. But there's, it, there's the increase in investment in automation and the data digitalization of that has caused a lot of... Uh, service providers to come into the system from Atlantic Canada. And uh, we're trying to keep on top of the list of those service providers. But I, I would I would really much advise that go down this process, do it right and look for a local service provider because you must run that equipment and you're always gonna have to tweak it. It's not a matter of just plugging it in and hoping it works. There's a lot more to the process than that. So you need to have that support. Yeah, I'd, I'd add to that, Jeff, that um, there is also the, the sort of pandemic piece of this. Pretty much every facility I've been around in the last year, there's been at least one skid with something under a sheet of bubble wrap on it. And uh, when I ask the question, it's, oh, we're waiting for the team to fly in from Michigan or from Rotterdam or from wherever the, the, the equipment is coming from. Um, so obviously, when you can't travel, you can't implement this stuff um, the approach we've taken is very much one of we're, in, we're a group of engineers we want to solve the problem um, we then form relationships with supply chain so when when we started in robotics we could have said okay we're going to represent one robotics manufacturer and sell their gear but we we chose not to uh, so we are very provider agnostic i think is probably the best way of describing it so we don't preferentially treat any any one member of the supply chain um, we, we are focused very much on solving the problem at hand for the producer, the farmer, the, the fish plant owner, whoever it is we're working with. And then we turn around to supply chain when we understand the process and the problem we're trying to work with to get the best bang for the buck, whether it's on vision or robotics or conveying or uh, machinery of, of any kind. Excellent. 
Kim, the, the, your work in the development of the apprenticeship program, you know, we, we often, it's, it, it's truly a marriage of skilled hands and innovative technology uh, coming together. How do you think the development and the increase, the passing in, in, of, of skills can further enable um, and, and de-risk the tech transfer and tech implementation on the firm? So um, I guess I would say that the farm technician program isn't looking specifically at any particular kind of technology, but just the ability to learn new technologies. Um, each farm with their journey person, each, each apprentice with their journey person on the farm is going to learn the technology specific to that farm. They're going to be exposed to that technology. They might see an overview of it in the classroom portion um, and then be able to apply it on a day-to-day -day basis. That classroom portion where you're getting some theoretical and then the practical application is allowing that tech transfer um, to occur on the farm. If you've got somebody that's on your farm and starting to do some of that tech transfer with you, the program's just gonna help to be able to manage things like uh, documentation when it comes to maintenance or who to contact, how to contact, you know, some of those, those processes. Um, but I would say definitely uh, just uh, facilitating the interaction between the farm leader and farm managers uh, is gonna do some of that, that, uh, that tech transfer and giving some um, empowerment to our middle managers to be able to take on some of those roles and take off some of the pressure on, on farm managers. Are, are we seeing, um, as we implement technology, um, different relationships with the customer? Are we seeing improved uh, connectivity with, the, with, with both the product and, and the end customer? Is there any, um, uh, you know, are we changing how we engage with uh, our customer based on implementing new technology and perhaps not dealing with what keeps us up at night so much, which is the labor, there are labor issues. In our case, I think um, probably on the consumer side and on the, uh, the wholesale side, they're not seeing the improvements that we're doing necessarily um, in, a, in a literal way. They're seeing the results, the quality of the product, the improved productivity. Uh, the lower cost production, lower costing a product, um, the more efficient handling and moving a product, having it available, you know, those kind of things they're seeing uh, and greater availability of local product in the, in the local market, certainly. Uh, but I'm, from my perspective, I don't see that, um, that consumers or wholesalers are recognizing that. I think they see it when we don't do it. Okay. They yeah. will notice if we're not going to be more efficient, if our costs are constantly going up, if we're not innovating in a way that meets their needs, they're absolutely going to see, you know, the lack of, of uh, adopt, adopt, adaptation of technology. Uh, but, you know, when we're doing it, I think they're like, oh, yeah, well, you know, that's the direction we're all going. We're all improving our use of technology. you got to, you know, stick with the program and keep moving ahead as, as consumers are expecting us to as wholesalers and other uh, customers are expecting us to do. Okay. Um, Alistair and Jeff, you work with a lot of companies. Have you seen the implement implementation of technology allowed the, pro the, the, the product and the relationship with the customer to improve? I can uh, tell you that uh, I've been having a lot of conversations with uh, like large retailers like Sobeys. And they are becoming increasingly aware of what their supply chain is uh, from an environmental and carbon footprint perspective. So it, it's really only been about a year or so with Sobeys, but they are very serious about it. And, and I think that we're starting to see the need for, um, f uh, you know, there's a terminology called uh, ESG. So large companies have to demonstrate that they're actually operating in a way that reduces carbon footprint. And I think if you, if you look at, read the tea leaves of what's going to happen in the next year or so as we, the government of Canada for sure, builds a plan for, you know, coming out of the pandemic in a cleaner, greener way, you'll see all kinds of incentives uh, at the retail level, i.e. your customer level, right down to the producer level 
to invest in uh, reducing your carbon footprint. So it may be, I'm, I'm pre-visioning here, and it may be of importance to Dustin and Kim, but I think that increasingly your, your customers will be asking, what are you doing to operate in the least impact on the environment? Uh, I don't know how you folks feel about that, Dustin or Kim. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, no, we, we, we see it more and more all the time. It's, uh, it's amazing. You know, uh, we, we talk about social license and, uh, and, and stuff like that, you know, um, what's expected of you as a, as a primary producer and, uh, and consumers are increasingly more and more cognizant of that. And they want to know, right. Uh, they, they, they want to know, um, you know, how I treat my cows and, and where they live. And they want to know what, uh, what happens to all that manure. They want to know, like they, they demand, we know this. And, uh, you know, we're seeing it more and more from, uh, from the retailers, you know, and they're, they're not so much, I guess, giving us um, an incentive to do that, but just demanding that, that our product is, uh, is up to those standards. So, uh, and that's, uh, that's going to be uh, even more important moving forward. From our perspective, it's the way that we started 10 years ago, 11 years ago, when we came into uh, ownership uh, at this level. And, uh, you know, we're always looking for ways to, to be more sustainable, to communicate that well with consumers. That's, that's the way we do business. Um, I don't see it as a new thing for us. Um, but, you know, part of our philosophy is how do we choose the different products and, and supplies and so on that we use? How do we, uh, how do we manage our waterways? How do we manage the environment around our farm? You know, we started recapturing rainwater instead of taking from the water table around us. Uh, we started, um, well, we've been using biomass for over 40 years. Uh, it's it's carbon neutral. The wood itself is, is re constantly regenerating, but we also internally have some guidelines about how we choose what kind of wood we're going to use. Uh, you know, we don't want to, we don't want to participate in deforestation. We choose to purchase wood. That's a byproduct of other operations already in our region that they need to get rid of, or it becomes a waste product. So we're taking a waste product and producing food. You know, we're, we're conscious of that. That's just part of the philosophy of how we do business. So we don't see it as a new thing. Um, and, and I guess the thing that we could do better is talk about it more, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. As we come close to, to the end, uh, hopefully there's 61 uh, people in the audience that are inspired to look at innovation and uh, adopting technology. What is one piece of advice that we can give them to this group about taking the next step, uh, going uh, uh, to, to, to on the journey of, of, of making this evaluation? What's a, the, uh, the next step or one piece of advice that you would give them? So I can try that first. Um, I, I think the biggest thing that I tell people, uh, you know, if they're willing to, or, or if they're, they're anticipating making a big investment on their farm is, uh, Go, go tour around, go, go see what other people have done. Um, you know, there's, uh, there's a whole plethora of different ways to, to get the job done. And even if you only pick up one tiny little bit uh, from, from one operation and you can utilize it on your operation, that's a win. So, uh, you know, like I alluded to earlier, um, you know, take some time and, uh, and, and go tour some other operations. It's amazing what you'll learn. From my perspective, and, and it's kind of the way we operate, the answer is always no if you don't ask. So you've got to start asking the questions. And maybe that question is, hey, Alistair, will you come to my farm? I don't know what the next thing is, but let's take a look at it. Jeff, will you come walk through with me and figure out how I'm going to fund it and make sure that it's going to make me or save me money? All I have to do is ask the question. I don't even have to know what direction the answer's in just walking through and being excited about what I do and where my industry is going and what the sector is doing, what my consumers need. I know those things, uh, but the guys that are working with technology every day and implementing new things and seeing the innovations other people are doing, they have some of those answers. I don't need to start with the answer. I just need to start asking the question. Absolutely. I would say be curious, you know, look at your own operation, be curious. And um, yeah, the, the, the network is here to help. 
we're all here for a reason. We love living here. We love either having, you know, raising our kids here or wanting to raise our kids here. Um, and we've got to make it work. I personally, I want to see much more local product in product in the grocery stores. And I proactively seek it out. Um, I go to the farmer's markets. More people need to be doing the same. So yes, Kim, you're right. You need to be shouting about it more. Um, and particularly the sustainability angles that you mentioned earlier. But yeah, curiosity, absolutely. I think uh, uh, Elf mentioned it earlier, but there's been a significant investment in the technology and innovation ecosystem. And it, it may not be apparent to the folks that are on this call, but there are organizations that cost nothing to, to talk to them and say, how would I approach this situation? Or is there anybody that's involved in this technology? And you'd be, I think you'd be shocked. If there, there's a lot of investment out there in technology that can improve your operations. If you are curious, you just have to be curious and then walk through the door, you'll be fine. Excellent, excellent. I wanna thank the panel. Jeff, Dustin, Alistair, Kim, each one of you contribute greatly to the ecosystem and supporting the sector and uh, have a, a significant uh, role in seeing this, this sector thrive and develop. Um, I wanna thank Perennia. This, these conferences and events take a lot of work, a lot of effort. Um, I know this group has been extremely well organized and uh, have snapped us into shape uh, quite reasonably nicely. Um, but I want to thank them. I want to thank the sponsors, FCC and Farm Loan Board. Again, their contribution uh, is essential for these, these, especially in these, these difficult times to put these things together. So FCC, Farm Loan Board, thank you. And most importantly, I want to thank the participants um, taking time out of your schedule, especially if it's uh, uh, you, you, you're taking time out of your business to invest in, in this, I think is a good use of time and I wanna thank you for it. Um, with that being said, Adam, if there's anything else um, you wanna say, I wanna uh, conclude this, this session. Um, and thank, I, I guess my last thing is thank the minister for having the, the, the providing the leadership to, to coordinate these. And uh, uh, that'll be my, uh, another thank you. Excellent. Thanks, everyone. Appreciate it. Thanks, everyone.